that on that keyboard. <laughs> so, um, all right, let's get into thawing. So if frozen fish is new to you, then thawing is probably a really new part of your routine. Um, and I love frozen fish now. I didn't know that I loved it before. It can be some of the highest quality, freshest, freshest fish you can buy. Um, because basically it locks in the freshness of the fish. The clock starts ticking as soon as fish has been pulled from the water. The more time it spends unfrozen, the less fresh it becomes. It just naturally, proteins naturally degrade over time. Anything does. So um, flash freezing or blast freezing, whatever the method is, these are very, very effective ways to preserve the quality, the texture, the taste um, of really, really good fish. Um, it stops the clock on any sort of changes that happen. Um, and just as a quick tangent, anytime you see Alaskan fish uh, on display at a supermarket or seafood counter, a lot of times it's fish that's been previously frozen and then thawed for display. So, um, you know, they're in some cases, if, if they're flying fish in fresh that day, it's during a very short period of the season, and you're also going to be paying a lot more for it um, because of the, the carbon footprint of that and, and just like the nature of flying something from uh, across the continent. But um, when you see something that's labeled as fresh, in most cases, it's a marketing myth. Um, the seasonality of salmon specifically, um, you know, it's, it's like a two or three month period in the summer. So the rest of the year, you can expect that it's frozen. Um, and when you see something displayed um, at a fish counter and it's not frozen, you really don't know how long it's been sitting there or if it's been going in and out of the, in and out of a freezer, you know, just to keep it fresh enough for display. So those are not good things. Freezing is not a bad thing, but refreezing and thawing and doing that over and over, that will affect the quality of the fish. So with seafood from Wild Alaskan Company, um, you basically just get to thaw it when you are ready to cook it so that it stays like at the peak of freshness. So that's why I am a frozen fish super fan now. Um, we have a link in the chat if you want to check out a blog post, I'd like to read a little bit more about that, but it's basically everything that I just said. So um, now that we're talking about frozen fish, let me grab a pack of frozen fish from the freezer. So um, I wanted to show you the, I guess, maybe you could call it the ideal method for defrosting fish. I have a filet of yellow eye rock fish here. This is a, a member special that we have from time to time. It's not a member special right now, but it's one that I um, had sitting in my freezer that I'd really like to use. Just a, another species of whitefish to try if you ever get the opportunity. So when I'm defrosting something in the fridge, first thing I always do um, when it's like a vacuum sealed pack is I will take it out of the package. So um, just a pair of scissors or whatever, whatever tool you have at hand for this. And then um, I tend to do this like maybe the afternoon before because I can't remember to do things at nighttime because I'm sleepy. So um, I think about, you know, the afternoon before, what do I want to have for dinner tomorrow night? Do I want to stay in? Do I want to make something for lunch? And I just put it on a plate just like that like a rimmed plate. I'd probably use like a one that has like a, a thicker rim just in case any of this um, ice glaze on the fish um, melts off. So I can't really see it very well in this, but this is like a little shiny and it has a really thick layer of ice on it. That's not freezer burn. That's actually an ice glaze that's applied over um, fillets. Um, not all of our seafood has an ice glaze over it, but on the fish especially, it's basically just a, another barrier um, to keep anything from the freezer um, from getting into the fish and keep some moisture in there. So um, don't be afraid of the ice glaze. That's that's very normal and a good thing. So um, now that I have that on a plate, I'm just gonna put it in my fridge on a low shelf, just like that. Um, and that's where it'll stay for overnight. I'm not gonna defrost that right now here, but um, you want it on a low shelf in case there's any leakages just to avoid any like cross contamination or like disasters. So you only have one shelf to clean up. So um, I don't cover it, uh, especially if I'm planning to use it the next day, um, because honestly, it's not going to smell. This fish is super fresh. 
Um, but if you feel like you do want to cover it, even just like loosely covering it with like a lid or, you know, some saran wrap, totally fine. Um, I would cover it if I knew I wasn't going to use it for, you know, like two or three days, but then why would I defrost it that day? You know, um, it, the fridge is a naturally drying environment. So that's the only reason I would cover it if I, you know, was expecting to leave it in the fridge for um, longer than a day or so. You just don't want the fish to dry out too much. Um, so yeah, that's how I defrost overnight. Um, that might not be very different than what you've done in the past, um, but you know, maybe I'm saving you a step, hopefully. So um, I call that the ideal method because it's very hands-off um, and also really gives you some control over when you cook the fish. You don't have to cook it that first day, although I do recommend it just so that it's at that peak of freshness. Um, you can cook it within three days uh, safely. And, um, you know, that's that, that way, if you're not exactly sure what your plans are, but you know you want to eat seafood, you have like a little bit of a window of time. Um, the convenient way, though, is the way I usually defrost fish. And that's the second method I'm going to share with you right now. Um, some of you are probably familiar with this, but um, what I would do is same thing, take it out of the package. And then where is my little baggie here? <laughs> I will put it back into a resealable bag. It can be like a silicone bag, or I just have these freezer bags that I rewash a million times and, and, and use until they're in shreds. So then I will put the fish, it can be one filet, it can be multiple filets in a pack or in, in this bag like this, seal it up, maybe press out some of the air. It doesn't have to be airtight. Um, and then, what I will do is, you'll see in the other camera here, actually, I have some fish already floating in this water. Let me just take this off. Um, then what I'll do is put it in a cold bowl of just tap water, not hot water, not warm water, cold water. Um, doesn't have to be ice cold. And submerge it. You know, you can use a plate to weigh it down, um, something like that. So over the course of an hour, usually, hour or less, this fish is gonna defrost very gently on the kitchen counter. Um, the water is gonna buffer it from room temperature so that it doesn't go through a drastic um, defrost. And yeah, then, you know, once it's thawed, then you can cook it. Um, the This is just super convenient because you don't have to plan ahead. I typically know that I wanna eat something um, and have an hour to plan. Um, so let's say like, I know that I'm going to have lunch today and I'd like it to be fish. I give myself an hour to sort of like plan what I want, maybe go to the store, do some chopping, um, and just have this on the counter, like, so that it's ready for me when I'm ready to cook it. So the, I guess one downside of this, I don't know if this is necessarily a downside is that you do need to cook it right away. You can't put this in the fridge for four hours later after it's defrosted. Um, and that's just a food safety, a good food safety practice because this is going to be at, you know, higher temperatures for an extended period of time. So using this method, just do it about an hour before you know you're about to cook and then you're you're good to go. Don't wait any longer than that. Just has to be cooked right away. So um, yeah, then I would just leave it in here like this maybe every 30 minutes change out the water in case it's getting too hot or too cold even. Um, you know, if you have a lot of fish in here and not enough water, sometimes the water will just get super chilled and super icy and it'll just draw out the thawing time. Um, so yeah, like cool water is exactly what you're looking for. Change it out every 30 minutes and then you're good to go. So um, I'm just gonna leave that in here off to the side for later, um, but in the meantime, let me just use this fishy plate again. Um, right before today's event, what I did was I defrosted a um, Pacific cod filet in this other bag because I didn't defrost my fish last night for even though I knew I was gonna cook today. Um, it's going to be definitely like a little bit wet because the um, ice glaze on the fish uh, was sort of like spitting a not right up against the filet, but it's trapped in the bag. And this is also one reason why you want to take fish out of the vacuum seal so that you don't have um, all of the ice glaze like sucked right against the filet. Because when you're cooking fish, generally you want to make sure that it's not like 
really wet, doesn't have excess moisture on the surface. That's why I'm actually putting it on um, a kitchen towel right now. I have um, a stack of these, so I would just pat fish dry after you take it out of the pack. Um, you can even defrost it on a paper towel or kitchen towel if you um, are defrosting it overnight in the fridge. But um, I'll get to this in a moment. Um, the other thing I wanna mention is that if you don't have time to defrost overnight, cause you forgot, if you don't have time to quick thaw because you're hungry right now, one method to consider is, especially with salmon, is cooking from frozen. This also can work with rockfish. Um, we have um, a, a little blog post on how to cook from frozen. It's really great when you're short on time, especially pan searing, because pan searing is like 15 minutes from freezer to plate. You have crispy skin and you're done. And that's like really saved me when I've been like hungry and didn't want to eat just like whatever junk food I had in the fridge. Um, so I do this from time to time. The one, I guess it's not like a big downside, but you do sacrifice some control over the doneness. So it might not be like your Michelin star version of seafood, but it's actually very good. Um, works really well if you have like thinner fillets because they cook a little more evenly. So that's just something to consider. Don't be afraid of it and don't be a snob because <laughs> I was a snob for a long time. And then I tried it and realized, oh, this is this is great. So um, before I move on, any questions about anything here? Yes, Kat, we do have a few. Um, one was, what is the disadvantage of thawing in a sealed package? So disadvantage of thawing in a sealed package, when you have um, vacuum sealed packaging and a filet that's been coated at an ice glaze, as you're defrosting it, um, all of that liquid is gonna basically be just like trapped right against the filet. And that can make it a little bit like soggier by the time you're going to use it. Um, that means it's not gonna be as crispy or like broil as nicely. It'll be like more, more prone to steaming. It's also just good food safety practice for anything, um, any type of seafood that's vacuum sealed. So um, I would just uh, definitely like for the sake of like making it really easy to um, cook fish really well, take it out of the pack. Great. And then is the fish still okay to eat if the vacuum seal is broken? Absolutely. Um, that happens from time to time, just like in in the, the shuffle of like getting it from, you know, the distributor to your door. And if that even just like wrestling things around in your um, freezer can break the seal of the package, uh, the fish is totally fine to use. What I would recommend is just use those fish first. Um, anytime you have frozen seafood that is consistently frozen, it's going to be safe to eat indefinitely. The vacuum seal just sort of protects it from the elements of the freezer. So, um, you know, if something has a broken seal, it's just going to be the one that's going to get, uh, um, you know, like oxidized a little more quickly or like develop um, like freezer burn a little more quickly. So um, yeah, you, use those first. That's my only recommendation, but don't have to worry about it at all. Like even if it's within three months, that, that, that's fine. Okay, and that was it. I think someone requested if you could repeat what you said about cooking the frozen fish. Oh yeah, sure. So when I cook frozen fish, I um, typically only do this with salmon and sometimes I do it with rockfish. Um, the advantage of this for both of these fish, actually rockfish I've cooked from frozen in an air fryer and rockfish is really, really easy, really difficult to overcook. It almost never gets dry. It's always flaky. So I like cooking that one in an air fryer. Um, like you basically just pop it in there for, um, I don't know, maybe like six minutes, maybe pat it dry, season it, and then put it in until it's done. Um, I'm not going to show you how to do that today, but I, uh, I can send you a, I'll just drop a little recipe in the, um, chat here, if I can pull one up really quickly, but with salmon, um, I, I like pan searing it from frozen if I know I want to eat something within like 15 minutes. So um, the disadvantage of cooking something from frozen is that you're not able to control the doneness as well as if you're cooking something that was defrosted completely. And that's because the outside always, is always going to cook way quicker than the inside if the inside is still frozen solid. Um, so that's, you know, 
one advantage of having like thin pieces of fish, uh, like thin fillets, um, because they're going to be cooking like a little more evenly. The inside will not be like, there's not going to be as big of a lag time. Does that make sense? Um, I, uh, you know, I, I definitely recommend trying it. Um, we have, uh, I think Sanana, yeah, she shared a link for how to cook salmon from frozen. Um, it's really something that's like saved me in a pinch. Um, and then I also dropped in like an air fryer rockfish recipe from frozen that, um, that I really like too. So, um, yeah, I think someone else was asking about paper towels. Yes. Uh, Deborah. So I do put paper towels on the plate when I'm defrosting in the fridge, um, because it just, you know, soaks up some of like the, the ice glaze that melts off. And I just have, I basically am, am, am doing the work for myself overnight instead of having to pat it dry the next day. Um, but you don't have to, um, you can always do that the next day. Um, shall we move on to part two? Yes, we shall. Okay, thanks. <laughs> um, I wish I could hear and see everybody, but this is a webinar, so I'm just um, imagining that you're all here. Um, part two is my sort of mini capsule collection of essentials. So cooking any species of fish, whether it's uh, some, some kind of wild salmon or any species of whitefish, even if you're not super familiar with that particular species, even if you've never heard of yellow eye rockfish in your entire life, um, these essentials are, I think, what make what can make it really be just like a basic, basic process, just as basic as cooking any other protein. Um, and I think the most important thing is actually not a physical tool, but it's the Wild Alaskan Company How to Cooking Guides. So we have lots of recipes, of course, but these cooking guides really break down per box different, maybe it's just not every single cooking method, but the ones that are maybe the most common. So how to sear, how to bake, how to, um, how to broil. These guides are really good if you're new to cooking fish um, or if you're new to cooking wild fish, um, especially wild salmon, because wild salmon cooks so much faster than farmed salmon. Farmed salmon is has a really unnaturally high fat content. So a lot of times you need to make adjustments in how you're using your heat, how you're using your time, even just the, the doneness um, you might need to adjust. So these guides are really, really good for that. Um, and, uh, you know, maybe even I would recommend bookmarking them um, just so you have them at hand um, as like a reference. Now, all of our recipes are more or less built around these sort of techniques, but these are really good step-by-step -step, um, introductions to cooking all of the species that you'd have in like a wild, com a wild uh, combo box or whitefish box or salmon box. So um, there's a little blog post about how farmed salmon measures up to wild salmon. If you want to kind of take a look at some of the differences between the two, um, wild whitefish uh, is pretty, it's not so different than like um, any whitefish that you've probably cooked in the past, but farmed salmon, especially uh, farmed and wild salmon will, will make a, a big difference for your cooking. So that's the number one essential. Second essential is super basic. You might not even think of it as a kitchen tool, but this is the one thing that is going to level up any seafood that you cook. So it is paper towels or kitchen towels. I use kitchen, like a clean kitchen towel. I have like a whole stack of these. I know the ones with the red stripe are like my fish towels. Um, but I, uh, you can totally use paper towels. I just go through so many paper towels that I'm tired of buying more and keeping more in my um, kitchen. Um, so I have a whole stack of these because this helps me pat fish dry. You know, cod, Pacific cod has a pretty high moisture content, so it can be a little funky to cook. You don't want to be like squeezing these out like sponges, but you really want to get a lot of that surface moisture off the fish. Um, this is going to make it really easy to cook fish really well. So if I were to broil this or sear this, or bake this now. Um, I have a surface that's dry enough to get crispy, get golden, pick up a sear, pick up grill marks. If I didn't do this, if I skipped this step, the fish would basically just steam. It wouldn't have a beautiful color afterward and it might end up sticking to um, whatever pan or 
crates or, um, you know, baking sheet I was using. So um, do not skip this step. It's written into most of our recipes to pat the fish dry. The only time you don't really need to do that is if you're, is if you're just like dropping this into like a stew. Um, but yeah, for sure, this is like the number one tool, paper towels, kitchen towels. Um, I know, I don't know how many of you are open to using kitchen towels, but what I usually do is after I'm done using this, I'll just rinse it off like in the sink, let it air dry, and then I'll throw it into my hamper and can't tell the difference. They stay nice and clean for another use for another day. So um, I think the next tool that I want to share is one of my favorites. Um, it's a fish spatula. So this is a long, a longer spatula than what you're probably used to, you know, compare this to compare this to something like this. If you're flipping fish, like really flaky fish with this, it's going to fall apart. Like it's going to fall in half, like right in front of you. And it's going to be very disappointing. This gives you a lot more room to work with. It's also a lot more flexible. So that comes in very handy when you're trying to get some fish off of a skillet or off of grill gate, grill grates. You can really get under there. Um, you never want to be forcing a fillet, but it just gives you like a little bit extra um, leverage uh, when you're flipping fish. It's also like very, very thin, um, which helps, um, you know, this is, this is pretty thin too. If you don't have a fish spatula, it's okay, but it just really makes it easy to become an expert in handling fish when you're moving it from one place to the next. Um, I also really like that it has these like uh, slats built into it. So if you're ever maybe doing like a shallow fry or trying to lift something out of poaching liquid, all of that stuff can just drain off naturally. Um, I use this for other things than fish too, um, because of that. Um, I ha had it in my um, utensil collection for a long time and I didn't know it was a fish, fish spatula. I just thought it was something like a fancy French thing. So anyway, I almost bring this with me everywhere if I know I'm going to cook and I'm not sure the person has a, a fish spatula. Um, so that's part of like, we, there's a blog post that we have that has like our top three cooking tools and it's one of the top three cooking tools. Another tool that I think is on that same list, maybe, maybe not, is an instant read thermometer. So this is a really great resource to have when you are new to cooking seafood, um, especially. I don't use it that much when I'm cooking seafood because I sort of know, um, I've done it so many times that like knowing when something's done almost feels intuitive. I know what it, what to look for um, just with the appearance of the fish. I know how flaky it should be, but this can really help you dial in the doneness um, because it gives you an almost in instantaneous read of the internal te temperature of fish. Um, and that can be a really good um, way to understand objectively how cooked through something is. So if, uh, you know, I like my salmon, both the sockeye and coho, I really like it to be sort of medium rare. And 120 to 125 is the temperature I'd want to aim for at the center of the filet if I want something medium rare. Now let's say you like something a little more medium, then you can use this to gauge if it's at 120 or 125. Maybe you want to make, go to 130 if you don't mind having fish that's a little medium. It's just something to help you um, understand the doneness if you're not sure and help you understand how you like something done. With really thick fillets, like for instance, today my cod fillet is pretty thin. Um, sometimes I get like a really chunky cod fillet and, and same with Pacific halibut. That is usually when I'll pull this out because I don't know how done the center is. It's hard to tell when you're just flaking the outside or maybe I don't wanna you know, destroy the fish by flaking it. I want it to look perfect. Then I'll use this um, when, when I'm not sure. So um, it's not a must have, but I think it can really help. You also can use it just to like see how, you know, what, what the temperature of your water is if you're boiling something for, for tea, for instance. I use this to measure um, how hot my water is for tea all the time. Um, the other tool that is actually not a physical tool is the member experience team. So the member experience team, my colleagues today that you saw earlier on camera, they're a really great resource for any food questions um, that maybe I haven't answered today. 
um, really good inspiration. They've got a whole selection of recipes that they like to share with you all. And, um, you know, if you have any questions about like, why is my fish sticking to the skillet? They can talk you through some of that. So um, do not be shy, reach out to them for sure. Um, I have a few ingredients that I'd love to share as well. So first thing I wanna start with is, um, I have these, these are actually gluten-free panko breadcrumbs because my store was out of panko, like regular, but um, I love, love panko breadcrumbs. They're like a little, a little more like, actually I'll show it in this video here. They're a little like crustier than like a, um, what is it? Like the Progresso breadcrumbs, I forget what the brand is. So these can create a really nice crusty surface on fish as like a breading, um, as just like a topping that you can kind of stick the fish under their broiler for, for a few minutes. It's also a really great ingredient to integrate into something like fish cakes, uh, salmon cakes, whatever you want to call them, salmon burgers, patties. Um, as a binding ingredient, it, it keeps things together and also gives it some like lightness and texture. So if I have panko breadcrumbs in my cabinet, I know that I can make something that doesn't just feel like fish on a plate. Um, not that there's anything wrong with fish on a plate, but it makes things like almost feel composed like instantly. I don't have to cook pasta. I don't have to cook rice. I can just put some breadcrumbs on it. And then I have a carb um, that's like nice and, and crusty and golden. So that's one of my ingredients that I cannot live without. Another ingredient is something like pesto. I don't make pesto because I really don't like having to. <laughs> I don't like having to empty up my or clean out my food processor or blender or whatever. It's also not really basil season, but um, if I just go to the store, it doesn't have to be like from like a deli. Like this is just from the deli across the street from me. Any like nice store-bought pesto is going to be really like a one-stop shop for flavor. And again, it's one of those things that you can just put on a filet of fish, toss it with, you know, some, some pasta, use it as a dipping sauce, whatever those things are that make a fish, like a, a, a plate of seafood feel more than, more like complete. Um, just super easy. If you don't like pesto, you know, you could pick up something like tapenade or like a, a sun, sun-dried tomato pesto, something like that to make it very easy for you to add flavor almost instantly to fish. Um, that just happens to be one of my favorites and I'm gonna use it today in a little bit. The other ingredient that I wanna share is, um, I can't read this, but it's miso paste. So miso paste is um, a fermented, like very salty, savory um, ingredient that I like to use in marinades, um, sauces, dressings. There are just so many applications for this that pair really nicely with fish. It's definitely not something that is a must have, but we have a lot of recipes on the blog that feature it because it's just such an instant like umami builder. So that like umami flavor is that like really meaty flavory or savory satisfying flavor um, that can that can replace like a lot of like actual meat in stock. Um, or in sauces. So um, this is something that I bought in the refrigerated section of my local grocery store. Um, usually that's where you'll find it because it's, it contains live cultures. Um, it's very salty and it lasts a long time. I think I've had this, if you've been to this event, event before, like I've had this in my fridge for at least since then, maybe like a year or two. It lasts forever because of the high salt content. Um, and it really just comes in handy. I'm gonna use this today as well. Um, the final thing isn't an ingredient. It's actually one more tool I forgot to mention. I love parchment paper. So of course, parchment paper is great for lining a pan, making sure things don't stick. You know, that makes it really easy. But um, for me, it's sort of my secret weapon for really, really, really easy seafood meals because you can turn this into uh, like a little packet. So I'm going to show you how to do that in just a minute. Um, but basically you put fish, vegetables, some other flavor stuff in the packet, and then you have uh, a recipe for perfectly flaky, flaky fish. So um, foil can do a lot of the same things. I just think it looks really nice when it's paper. It's almost like a present. So 
Um, any questions about anything that I just shared? Anyone? Okay, maybe not. I don't know if Sanan is still here or not, but um, if we have no questions, let's go ahead and move on. Um, right now I have my oven preheated to 425 degrees. Um, I am gonna cook some Pacific cod and papillote with some vegetables and pesto. And it's just gonna be a very simple, very easy meal to make. Um, no recipe required basically. So um, let me talk about this method. When you're cooking and papillote, um, it basically just means that you're cooking in like a pouch. Um, it's the, the, French, the French translation of that and sounds super fancy. So um, if you're ever doing this with fish that has skin on, I would leave, ooh, what color is my miso? This is like a white miso paste. Um, thanks for asking. I, uh, there's, there are different colors of miso. There's like a yellow, white, red. Those are just um, different expressions of different ingredients. Um, I think like the white miso tends to use more rice, whereas the red miso tends to use another bean that I'm forgetting or another grain. Um, I like white miso with seafood because it has a milder flavor and just is a little more versatile. So, um, you know, yellow works really well too. It, it's just gonna give you like a slightly different flavor. None of them are a wrong choice, but like, um, I really like mixing this with like butter, for instance, to make a, a miso compound butter. It's literally just miso and butter mixed together. And it is so good on top of fish. So thanks for the good question, James. Um, all right, let me, show you what I'm going to do. Um, well, first of all, <laughs> I'm actually going to use some broccoli that I had sitting around in my freezer. Um, this is a really great way to use frozen or great method to use for frozen vegetables. Um, so actually, I just like also quick thawed these on my counter um, in like a bowl of cold water. You can do something normal, like thaw them in a microwave. But since I was defrosting fish, I just kind of did the same thing. So let me Go ahead and drain this out. Um, the great thing about frozen vegetables is that they're already blanched for you before they're frozen. So that means they're partially cooked and they don't really need that much more time to, um, you know, to be cooked and done. Um, if I were using raw broccoli here, it might not be totally cooked by the time the fish, um, you know, the fish is cooked through. So I'm just going to put this, get all these water droplets off of here. I'm going to put the vegetables on the bottom. If you want to use fresh vegetables for something like this, I would recommend picking something that's like a quick cooking, something like sliced zucchini, um, snap peas, snow peas, green beans, um, a lot of green things. Anything that is tender enough to cook within about 10 or 15 minutes. If you're doing something like potatoes or raw broccoli or like butternut squash, those are still going to be raw by the time the fish is cooked. And you want to try to get everything to cook around the same time. So this is a great use of frozen vegetables. Um, and uh, one that I discovered at one of these events, and I'm really happy that I discovered it because now it's pretty much what I do. I just go buy a bag of corn or, or broccoli and, and know that I'm going to cook it like this. So to this, let me just add a little bit of olive oil for flavor, maybe some salt, just season this up a little bit. And on top of that, I'm going to add my filet of fish. If you have a filet with the skin on, I would just put it skin side down here. Um, you don't have to eat the, the, the fish skin after because it is going to be not, not crispy, um, but it'll help um, keep the fish super moist while it's cooking in here. That's where a lot of the fats are stored in, um, the skin, like any, any, um, fats are going to be concentrated there. So on top of this, I'm going to use some pesto and this is great because I had to do nothing but just spoon it on right on top. I like this to be like a little generous because it'll help flavor the, um, the broccoli underneath it as well as it cooks it'll kind of like melt melt off of this so that looks good to me um i already know that this tastes pretty good as is so i'm not even going to bother seasoning the fish anymore but just for good measure let's do a little 
extra olive oil on top. And then to this, the broccoli has some liquid actually, so you don't really need to add any any more liquid to this so that it'll steam in the oven, because that's the idea. We're basically gonna turn this into a packet where everything in here steams itself. All these flavors will infuse, all of the juices will sort of meld together. Um, but I do like to add like a splash of something like white wine, even like red wine is fine here too. Um, or if I have like veggie stock in the fridge, I'll add a little bit of a splash of that. Or what I also like to do is almost make like a little miso, miso broth, um, like almost giving it like a miso soup addition here. So I'm going to add uh, maybe a tablespoon or two of water and just like whisk this up a little bit. Until you, you're basically just making tasty water here. You don't have to do much measuring. Um, if you, if you're not familiar with miso, just start, start small and let's see. That's tasty water. So I'm going to pour this. It's not perfectly whisked. It's fine. Um, just going to pour this all around the fish here. And the reason why I'm building this in this baking sheet is so that if I'm pouring liquid in here, it doesn't spill all over the counter. This just helps me keep it in place. And now the fun part is turning this, actually that was all fun. The fun part is turning this into a packet. Um, so what I do is just start at a corner that feels comfortable to me. I don't know, I guess, cause I'm right-handed. I like to start this way and then start making little pleats around like you're folding up a dumpling or an empanada, something like that. This is a lot easier to do if, you have, if you're using foil since it sort of crimped on itself, but uh, you know, it also doesn't have to be perfect. So then I usually just like to turn this last end underneath so that it stays a little bit better. And there you have it, like a little packet, like a little pastry calzone, <laughs> I always call it. And this is going to go into the oven for with this fish at this temperature, with this thickness, I'm going to say 10 minutes. So right now it's 345 in New York. Hopefully um, I can wrap things up uh, before four o'clock. So I don't have you here forever, um, but we'll check on it in about 10 minutes. So um, any questions right off the bat about what I just did technique wise? Um, anything. Yes, there was one question about um, the, the time, uh, amount of time that you leave it in the oven for with using paper. Um, with using the paper for something, we have a few different recipes that have a few different temperatures and cook times on the blog. But when I'm just sort of making things up as I'm going, um, like today, for instance, my oven is at 425 right now. For whitefish, I would say eight to 10 minutes. So actually I might check on this a little bit earlier just in case, because you can always check sooner um, and, and you can't ever turn back time if it's overcooked. So um, with salmon, um, depending on the thickness, also something like six to eight minutes. Um, just uh, the, an easy way to check it is if you have an instant read thermometer, you, you can just like stab it through the pack like that, which is feels very satisfying. Um, it's not a hermetically sealed package, so it's okay if a little bit of the steam comes out. Just be careful, obviously. Um, if you don't have a thermometer, you can just open it up and sort of see how flaky it is. Um, you know, take a look with your fork or, you know, even just see if it's falling apart. Um, but generally, I would say between eight to 12 minutes, depending on the temperature of your oven. Um, the oven doesn't have to be a precise temperature, you know, like um, because it's in this packet, it's sort of buffered from the heat. So whether it's 350 or 450 or anywhere in between, as long as the oven is hot, it'll cook this way. Uh, it just needs to be hot enough to generate steam. Um, you know, other cooking methods, you want to be a little bit more precise with the heat because it's it's more direct. Um, so yeah, that's what I'm doing today for this. And then if you used wine instead of miso, what would you do with the wine? 
I would literally just do a splash right in there. It can be on the fish. It can be around the fish. I usually just aim for the bottom so that it's not like making a huge mess. Um, but I would add just a, a tablespoon, maybe two tablespoons. I think a tablespoon is actually good. Just like trying to envision in my head how, how much juice is going to be in there. So um, that wine will cook with everything and just add like a little more of that aromatic flavor that's going to be really really delicious um once you open up the packet all these juices will melt together and um it's not like a soup exactly but it'll be very saucy so i have my my bowl afterward so that i can transfer all of that um to the um to the dish so um white wine is great rosé is great I've even used red wine. I know like red wine and fish. Oh my gosh, it's totally fine. You're only using a splash of it. It'll just maybe make it look a little more like muddy just because of the color, but it, it's still very, very delicious. Um, if you have old wine sitting around in your fridge, which I um, often do, so. Amazing, thank you, Kat. I think that was all the questions. Okay, um, the, we have a few more minutes before this is cooked, actually several more minutes before this is cooked, but. Let me talk a little bit about why I love this method. So it, um, I guess just to sum it up, if you're a beginner, if you're new to cooking fish, like I said, any species, this is a really great way to set yourself up for success because the fish is cooking very gently. Um, you can almost guarantee that it's gonna be nice and flaky unless you completely overcook it. It's going to be nice and flaky no matter what you do. There are really no moving parts. You know, I put it in the packet, closed it up, put it in the oven. And then that's really all I have to, all I have to worry about is checking on it, you know, at, at around the eight minute mark usually. So um, yeah, red Pinot Noir is really good with salmon. A lot of times um, the region where something is from matches up with the vegetables or the fruits of that area. So um, there are, you know, historically wild salmon in the Pacific Northwest, which is a great Pinot Noir region. So those go really, really well together. Um, that's a great, great uh, recommendation, William. Um, so as a beginner, it's a really good way to set yourself up for success. And you don't really have to um, have any special skills, really. You just have to be good at folding something. Everything else is very, very much intuitive. The um, reason I like it for anyone though, especially if you're, if you consider yourself like an expert in the kitchen or anywhere, you know, anywhere above beginner, there are so many possibilities in terms of like culinary creativity here. You can do something like I did today with just some frozen vegetables and pesto with a little bit of this miso, whatever mixture I made. You could also do something like um, maybe a splash of coconut milk with curry paste or curry powder some aromatics, like throw in some ginger, garlic, scallions on a bed of zucchini, or don't even put vegetables in there. You don't have to put vegetables in there, but that in itself would be like a really rich, delicious, fragrant meal. Um, you could do something like a splash of heavy cream with Dijon, dill, some sliced mushrooms. That's a good combination as well. Like you really just, the main thing you need is like a little bit of liquid which can even come from like a couple lemon slices and cherry tomatoes, a little bit of liquid and some fish and some flavors. Um, and I, I think it's really, it's really cool to be able to have that kind of um, opportunity to like experiment with flavors and know that the fish is probably going to come out. Okay. <laughs> um, like I said, it's not a completely foolproof thing. If you leave this in the oven for 20 minutes, it's probably going to be dry, but if you stop it anywhere before then, it's probably still going to be edible. And if 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 it's too dry, just turn it into fish cakes, you know. So that's my that's my fail safe for this. Um, any other questions? I have a few um, more minutes before I check on this. Um, anyone um, have any favorite combination? Yeah, somebody. Yeah, somebody did ask about your the color of your miso. Yes. Yes. Um, wild salmon, does wild salmon skin do well in parchment paper? So I actually don't, well, it depends on what you meant, mean by do well. I think you mean crispy. And in that case, it will not stay crispy like this here. I, um, would, if you want to crisp up, crisp up the skin, what I would do is 
remove the skin before you put the fillet in parchment and then just crisp up the skin on your own, um, like in, a, in its own pan. Like I've done that before and it's great. Um, I actually will eat the salmon skin if it's steamed and tapioca like this, because I, I don't personally mind that it's not crispy. Um, you know, maybe part of that is just me brainwashing myself into thinking it's good and, and delicious and good for me. But um, honestly, like it, it softens up really nice, nicely. Um, and I totally understand why people would not like soft salmon skin as, as uh, something to eat. But um, with all the flavors in it, like I find like this works really, really well for it. Um, I would not transfer the whole fish to a stovetop afterward to crisp up the skin. I would just save that for another, another recipe for another cooking method for another day. So. And the Good. last question was what temperature did you bake the fish at? Um, this is 425, but there are, like I said, recipes that we have on the blog that are in papillote or in a pouch that have a different range of temperatures, like 350 to 450. There's not really a wrong temperature um, that I've experienced yet. So um, I'm going to check the fish now because I think we could be, we could be there. We could be getting close. So um, just as you're handling it, obviously, um, don't forget that this is hot because you're going to be thinking about this and not the sheet pan. Um, I'm going to use my thermometer here just to see how done this is. And if I'm close, then I'll go ahead and open this up. Um, so I'm aiming for the center. Uh, this is definitely not going to be done, but let me open it up so that we can look at it um, since we're all here. And I don't want to keep you for too long today. So if, if I didn't have a thermometer, what I would do is just open up the packet to see how this is looking. So that look really, it smells really good right now. Um, if I were checking on the doneness without a, a thermometer, what I would do is just, if you can see this a little better, I would just see how easy it is, a, is to flake the corner. Right now you can see that I can't get the fish to flake. It's just like still staying intact. Like even if I lift it up a little bit, that means it's not done yet. Um, if this were done and Pacific cod, especially using like a, a, a very moist cooking method like this, Pacific cod becomes so tender and just falls apart. It's so crazy to see that transformation. So for sure, this is not done yet. All I have to do is, I don't know, roughly try to close this up again. A lot of the steaming has already happened. So, you know, don't feel like you just lost all the fruits of your effort. And that's gonna go back in the oven for a few minutes here. Um, and we'll see if I can uh, check on that maybe in another minute or two. Um, like I said, I wanna try to wrap this up by four, but um, if we don't have any other questions right now, let me just talk a little bit about um, our exclusive member special that we have running right now. Um, I just wanna like wrap this up by talking about, um, we have a really, really cool um, limited time box that features um, so it's sort of like our Valentine's Day box. It features some extra special seafood offerings. So it has two packs of weather vane scallops. If you've never had weather vane scallops before, they are so, so good. Um, I don't know if you have drop in the chat. I'm curious how many of you here have had the weather vane scallops. They're just like the best scallops you'll ever have. Um, or some of the best scallops you've ever had. I've had great diver scallops too from Maine, but weather vane scallops are actually uh, the biggest species of scallop in the world. Um, not to say that these will be the biggest scallops ever. They're usually like a nice, perfect size, um, but I am obsessed with them. You'll get two packs of those. Yes, they are the best. It's true, Sonana. I know you work here, but they really are the best. Um, you get two packs of bone-in Pacific halibut steaks. We haven't had these in, actually, I think they were just a, a a member special where you just got the halibut steaks, but this box comes with um, halibut steaks. Um, they're bone in with skin on. So they actually uh, stay a little bit more juicy than like a filet of Pacific halibut. The flavor is similar, but they're, I find that they're easier to cook and easier to flip in a pan um, just because of like the, the way the grain goes on like a steak cut versus a filet cut. 
Um, it also comes with a big old bag of dungies. So snap and eat Dungeness crab. Um, it's all great stuff. Even if you're not like looking to buy fish for Valentine's Day. Um, it is a member special that we're offering with that in mind because I don't know, that sounds like a romantic dinner, some a little bit of crab, a little bit of scallops as like an appetizer, maybe a, a Pacific halibut steak. That's if you even do Valentine's Day. I tend to stay in and, and not go outside. So it's perfect for me personally. Um, there's a link for that in the chat if you wanna take a look at what that box has. If you're not a member yet, you cannot get the exclusive limited time box, but we have a surprise for you. For you, you can get um you can use the code live25. That's L I V E 25 for $25 off your first box of amazing seafood from Wild Alaskan Company. Um you can sign up at the homepage that's wildalaskancompany.com. That is right in the chat as well. And if you're still with me, let's check on the fish. I'm gonna I'm gonna hope that this is ready now because it smells so good. Especially because I already opened up the packet a little bit. I feel like a lot of the aromas are escaping and just like taunting me now. Um, so what I'm going to do is even if it's not ready, let's go ahead and plate this thing. Um so now it's probably not quite done yet, but this side I can see is flaking. So I'm gonna move this packet to this bowl and give you a better view here. So you can serve it actually in the packet like this. Um, my mother-in-law just had me over for dinner and, and we had like little individual packet um, for each of us, or you can slide it into um, your bowl or plate, whatever you're using. And you'll see it has like all these really beautiful juices right here at the bottom. There's nice like olive oil, like golden little pools here. And this broth, let me get a spoon. It's so tasty. Oops, that's a fork. This broth here, it's so delicious. Yum. It's got like miso flavor, a little bit of that like seafood taste in it. Um, like Pacific Cod's very, very mild, but a little bit of that savoryness has melted into that, plus some of the pesto, and it's just like absolutely perfect. I'm not, I'm not going to be afraid to eat this in the corner here because I know this is done. Um, but once it's actually really done, this will flake so much easier than this just did. But was, you know that corner is perfect. What I can do is just stick this back under the oven on the baking sheet if I want to finish cooking it. Um, but that's so good. I eat this all the time. I mean, the, with the rest of this, uh, I, I feel like I don't even use pesto for anything but this meal. It just is the meal that keeps on giving. And I'm so creative other times, but when I'm hungry, I just want to eat this, the same meal over and over. Um, any questions? Uh, I know I see some of you have to go, but, oh, that's amazing, Teresa. Um, yeah, I don't know. I'll let you go because we're at four o'clock. Join us next week if you're around. I'll be cooking Pacific halibut steaks uh, and I'm gonna be making them in an au poivre sauce. So basically another French word, uh, creamy peppercorn sauce. It's just the ideal food couple. So it's sort of like our homage to Valentine's Day. Hopefully it inspires you to make something fancy for yourself at some point. It's so fun. Um, I'm really looking forward to it. It's one of my favorite dishes that um, I've uh, made and eaten over the years. So until then, have fun in the kitchen, make some epic meals along the way. And as always, live wild. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, William.